The history of Elder Scrolls Online is a fascinating one, filled with amazing stories. In this video, we'll cover many of them, the foundations that inspired it, its catastrophic launch that almost took it under, followed by its successful resurrection that snapped victory from the jaws of defeat. We'll touch on the hacker that was able to win guild trader bids in a hilarious way, how the name of one of the in-game zones came to be banned from Bethesda livestreams, along with the terrifying three-letter word Yes, that disgusting obscenity was also banned from ESO live streams. And the announcement that the developers are working on an entirely new game behind the scenes, possibly an MMO? Are the developers cheating on ESO? Is this new unannounced title the new favorite child that's getting all of Sauce's attention these days? In this video, we're going to talk about the absolute state of ESO and its rather fascinating journey to get here. Let's go back to the beginning. Elder Scrolls Online wasn't officially announced until 2012, but rumors started flying well before that when the public noticed the acquisition of the domain name Elder Scrolls Online. Online.com. Fans of the franchise were overjoyed at the possibility of being able to run around the Elder Scrolls universe with a friend. Uh, and we are very excited because there was very big news dropped today, which is that the Elder Scrolls Online is a real thing. That was just announced and it's being developed by ZeniMax Online Studio, which is not Bethesda Game Studios, it's a separate studio and actually headed up by somebody who worked on Matt Furor, who worked on Dark Age of Camelot. It would become clear in a lot of ways that Elder Scrolls Online was going to be a spiritual successor to Dark Age of Camelot. Elder Scrolls Online would be serving two masters, DAOC fans and Elder Scrolls fans, but there were many, many more Elder Scrolls fans. For those that don't know, Dark Age of Camelot was an MMO released in 2001 and set in the period immediately after King Arthur's death, where his kingdom was split into three realms, which remained in a constant state of war with each other. The three realms were Albion, no, not that Albion, this Albion was the realm of knights and damsels based on the Thurian mythology, with Camelot as its capital. Then the other two realms were Hibernia, which was based on Celtic folklore, and Midgard, which was based on Norse mythology. The constant PvP that ensued between these realms would be the primary selling point of DAOC. It did very well for itself in the early and mid-2000s, finding a nice seat between games like Lineage 2 and EverQuest in terms of popularity. Unfortunately for all of the aforementioned MMOs, World of Warcraft would release in November of 2004, making it noticeably harder for any of these to survive and thrive. In 2007, ZeniMax Media, the parent company of Bethesda, recognizing Elder Scrolls would fit perfectly into an MMO, and seeing the massive success that was World of Warcraft, hired Matt Furrer to head ZeniMax Online Studios. Matt Furrer was former executive producer of the very successful Dark Age of Camelot. When the newly formed ZeniMax Online Studios, or ZOS, started development on the game, Oblivion was their gold standard, having come out the year prior. Initially, the game was built with Oblivion in mind, but by the time they launched seven years later, Skyrim would come out and be a worldwide phenomenon. Therefore, Elder Scrolls Online was going to have to adjust to that accordingly. Which reminds me, Skyrim came out five years after Oblivion. Imagine only having to wait half a decade for an Elder Scrolls game. Those were the days. At least we have 17 versions of Skyrim to wipe our tears away with. But circling back to DAOC, Matt Fur wasn't the only thing coming from DAOC to ESL. You could say the similarities that exist between the two weren't just skin deep, they were bone deep, the same leadership, and the same endgame. ESO Cyrodiil would attempt to recreate the popular tri-faction PvP that existed in DAOC. There would be one problem with this plan though, ESO would naturally be bringing in an enormous number of Oblivion in Marwyn and Skyrim players, players not exactly known for their PvP appetites. And so Elder Scrolls Online launched in 2014 with massive interest, but just as massive as the interest was the disappointment. The game-breaking bugs were hard to ignore. Plus, the game suffered a lot of the same problems that many MMOs launch with. On top of those bugs were performance issues, a lack of end-game content, and duping. But that wasn't the only thing not sitting well with players at launch. ZeniMax also added a day one DLC to the game. In a move so bold that the Terminator would think twice before moving forward with it, they broke out one of the races and made you buy it separately. On launch day, as a buy to play MMO with a $15 subscription. A day one DLC like this was unheard of for an MMO with a required sub. This event would foreshadow the unusually aggressive monetization path that ESO would pursue for the rest of its life. The community had a lot to say about this at launch. Here's a snip from one of the reviews that got over 7 million views. The 10th Imperial race is locked off to you unless you pay extra for the collector's edition. Now say, You'd truly like to experience all this game has to offer, correct? Well, then the only way to do that is to travel around on the horse, select any faction you would like to be a part of, and have access to the 10th Imperial Race, only available for $20 more. 
As fast as Elder Scrolls Online had attracted the attention of millions of fans, it lost it. Player numbers plummeted. The faction system made it so you literally couldn't see friends in other factions, let alone play with them. If you went to an enemy faction town, it was a ghost town with no one inside. There wasn't an end game except to go to Cyrodiil and PvP, and many fans of the Elder Scrolls franchise had no interest in PvP. On top of that, ESO's launch was also noticeably absent of rating. Fortunately for fans of the game and the franchise, the developers didn't give up on the game. To appease existing players and to lure old ones back, less than one year after the launch, Elder Scrolls Online would drop its required subscription, instead opting for an optional subscription accompanied by its now infamous Crown Store, a monetization machine capable of making Vegas casinos blush. The Radiant Apex mounts in here are likely to cost you an astounding $400 and beyond. The bright side, the cash shop was mostly cosmetic and convenience items without anything to pay to win. Before the next step, let me take one second to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, another amazing MMO, Guild Wars 2. Guild Wars 2 is one of the highest rated MMOs of all time and has just launched on Steam for the first time. Their latest expansion, End of Dragons, is out now with loads of new content. Don't worry, you can play the core game for free, which includes over 200 hours of gameplay. Jump in and create a character using their robust character creator, and don't worry about feeling overwhelmed. Guild Wars 2 has an incredibly welcoming community and a great new player guide to help get you started if you have any questions. Guild Wars 2 is not a grindy MMO, it's much more about the journey, the story, and the exploration. And speaking of exploration, just wait until you get on one of Guild Wars 2's amazing mounts. I guarantee you've never ridden anything like them. Check out the link in the description to get an XP boost pack and a mini pet for your new Guild Wars 2 character. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the video. Around this time, ESO would commit to something that fans of the game would grow to love. It would begin focusing on an aggressive schedule of frequent and substantial content additions being added to the game. This would become something that defined ESO moving forward. As sure as the sun will rise, ESO will add new content every 12 weeks. And this is still true to this day. Later on, well after the launch of Elder Scrolls Online, in a PAX Australia interview, Matt Furr would be asked what he missed about the old days of game development. His response was, and I'm paraphrasing, that he missed how much cheaper it was to build games back in the day, because it meant you could take more risks. Nowadays, with the costs associated with making games, you can feel very pigeonholed into making exactly what's expected because the stakes are so high. It was a response that really got me thinking when I heard it, given that he said it after making Elder Scrolls Online, which is reported to have cost around $200 million at launch. Not only did it cost $200 million, but it was one of the most volatile launches in history. With that much online, I imagine that he and the team had a few stressful nights working through the launch. It makes sense that part of him looked back on those simpler days with some fondness. Moving on to May 2015, ESO would finally add its trials in Craglorn, and in June of 2015, ESO would release on console, creating its most massive wave of interest in the game to date. The console launch was really the beginning of ESO's success story, and for a while, console players accounted for the majority of ESO's player base. In June 2015, 15, ESO also announced its first major DLC, The Imperial City, which added a new PvPVE zone and new dungeons. Just one example of how massive Elder Scrolls Online is, Elder Scrolls Online contained more than 10,000 NPCs, which was enough to land it in the Guinness Book of World Records as having the most unique NPCs in a video game. The developers were just getting started. In the following quarters, they would also add the Orsinium DLC, which added a new zone and a new solo arena, the Thieves Guild DLC, which added a new zone and a new passive tree, the Dark Brotherhood DLC, which added a new zone and a new passive tree. And then in 2017, its first major chapter expansion, Morrowind. Morrowind wasn't just a nostalgia trip. This would be one of the game's most substantial expansions ever. In January of 2017, ZeniMax announced it had around 1 million monthly active users. And then in June of 2017, with its Morrowind expansion hot off the press, ZeniMax announced that ESO had more than 10 million accounts made and a staggering 2.5 million monthly active players for the release of Morrowind. The Morrowind expansion had clearly succeeded in bringing a ton of players back. After this, ESO would no longer report its monthly active users, and I'll leave it to you to speculate as to why. Instead, ZeniMax would simply continue to report the number of players that have tried the game in total, through purchase or through free trial weekends. But regardless, their hard work was paying off in spades. The commitment to an impressive content cadence while fixing the game had brought a lot of the players back. The game was by all accounts successfully saved from the brink of death. Pete Hines would even go on to say that ESO was one of the most successful Elder Scrolls games in the franchise. Pretty impressive comeback for an MMO that almost didn't survive its launch. 
2017 was also fascinating for another reason. A hacker demonstrated that he was able to inject code into ESO that allowed him to purchase guild traders that normally cost players tens of millions of gold for the cold hard value of negative one gold. Yes, you heard me. He didn't even have to pay one gold and he was awarded a guild trader. Now, remember, this was three years after the game's release when he did this, and it seems he got away with it. He showed himself standing there with his newly acquired guild. How many other people were able to get away with this before he published this? I wonder. This wasn't the only way he was able to exploit ESO. He was also able to have his friend buy an item he listed on the auction house for negative one gold. While his friend paid negative one gold for the item, when he received his gold from the purchase in the mail, the game had given him over four billion gold. Man, that would have saved me from doing a lot of writs. MMOs are complicated beasts and there are insanely clever people in this world, which has always left me curious about what other vulnerabilities players are able to take advantage of in all of these MMOs I've played. And which ones are they still taking advantage of today? If you're enjoying the video, please be sure to like and subscribe. The PvP Saga. Now, 2017's Marwyn was a massive expansion, but perhaps most notably, it added the first DLC class, the Warden, bringing the game's total number of classes to five. It also added the Battle grounds, which unfortunately for the PVPers was the last new PVP update the game received. Over five years ago now, you have my condolence PVPers, rest in peace my brothers. Therefore, this expansion would begin two sagas. One would be that of the Tribunal, a handful of mortals turned demigods. The other would be that of the PVPers versus the developers. I'll cover the latter saga first. Server performance in PVP was getting worse and worse, combined with a complete lack of balance and a lack of content for the PVP players, this would serve to create a growing unrest in the ESO PVP community. A a game that had first advertised itself as a home for PvP players, a game that had put epic siege battles in all of its trailers to bring PvPers in, was now turning its backs on those very players. This would continue for years until tensions between the developers and the PvP players would come to a head. PvPers would ask for updates on the server performance and PvP content during every Zenimax livestream. Zenimax Online Studios, failing to have a good answer, took the surprising step of banning the word Cyrodiil from its own livestreams. They literally banned the name of a zone in their own game from their own stream so they wouldn't have to talk about it. This only added fuel to the fire, so the tensions rose. Players were not allowed to talk about the PvP zone. It was blacklisted. If they dared utter the name of the zone during the live stream, they would either be timed out or banned. If they simply typed the word PvP in chat, they would also be banned or timed out, putting on display for everyone how much of a problem these three little letters were for the developer. I'm timed out. I'm timed out, guys. I'm timed out for saying PvP. You can't even say PvP in the live stream. You said PvP and it got deleted. Oh my it's interesting. God. Cover a PvP game doesn't let you say PvP in the live stream. Server performance had gotten so bad in Cyrodiil that it was unplayable. If you were lucky, it would only be lagging in Cyrodiil. If not, you would crash out of the zone and the game entirely. Performance wasn't bad, it was unplayable during peak outers. After years of PvPers begging Zenimax to upgrade their servers and years of Zenimax telling the players that replacing the aging server hardware would not impact performance, Zenimax announced that they would need to replace their decade-old 2012 era servers that they had been using since the game launch. They were also quick to point out that this wasn't for performance, but because the hardware was old and failing. Interestingly, however, performance was noticeably improved and PVPers were left puzzled as the devs had explicitly stated countless times the lag was not a hardware issue. And to be fair, the developers weren't entirely wrong. While performance definitely improved, it's still far from perfect during peak hours, even today. As for the other saga, the Tribunal. The main character known as the Vestige would head from Morrowind to Sothisil's Clockwork City before making his way to Somerset in 2018 to join up with Darien Gautier to go head to head with the big bad, Nocturnal. Somerset was massive for ESO. It added the brand new Sigic Guild and jewelry crafting. This would be the last of the massive overarching stories spanning multiple years. Instead, ESO would opt for their more compartmentalized yearly stories moving forward, with at most only the faintest thread tying them together. I understand why they did this. They wanted you to be able to log in and start in any zone you wanted and go to the zone you wanted to in any order that you wanted to. But this was definitely at the cost of delivering a much more epic and drawn out story. Story. Every expansion now feels a bit like trying to fit the entire season of Game of Thrones into half an episode. Now, entire stories, start to finish, have to be told within the span of a small handful of zone quests. Nothing that happens inside of them could have a lasting impact on what comes before or after as players might not do the content in that order. But with this concession came the ability for players to jump in and play with anyone at any time. They didn't have to go play through hundreds of hours of story to join up with their friends. They could go straight to the zone their friend was in. Pros and cons, I suppose. In 2019, ESO added its 
second DLC class with the Elsewhere expansion, which was the last new class added as of the making of this video, bringing the total number of classes to six. In addition to that, Elsewhere finally brought dragons back, something Elder Scrolls Online fans had been sorely missing since Skyrim back in 2011. And perhaps just as important to the future of ESO was what happened outside of ESO in 2019. 2019 was a year to remember as ZeniMax Online Studios created a lot of buzz when Matt Furr would confirm that ZeniMax Online Studios was working on a new massive project for a brand new IP. Since then, we have seen this project attract some serious talent. We even saw some formerly ESO developers move on over to this project. Presently, all we can do is speculate what it might be, but the project is described on their hiring page as grand in every sense of the word. It also says that they will be utilizing the knowledge and experience they've gained from making ESO. Is this new project an MMO? Rumors are running wild. There seems to be a lot of talent on the team with a history of working on space environments. Whether it's a coincidence or not, it's causing some to speculate that perhaps they are making a space themed game or even an MMO, with one article even suggesting that it would be a Mandalorian MMO. Time will tell, but the real question and the reason for bringing this up in this video is what kind of impact is this going to have on the development of Elder Scrolls Online? Elder Scrolls Online is now sitting next to this younger, grand in every sense of the word project and looking kind of old. Are talent and resources being diverted to the new project, leaving ESO high and dry? That might just be happening. We'll circle back to why I think this at the end of the video. 2020 arrived and this was a fantastic year for Elder Scrolls Online. ESO's Steam player numbers would double thanks to the perfect storm. ESO would drop their ultimate weapon, the nostalgia bomb that was Skyrim. Meanwhile, Mother Nature was dropping her ultimate weapon, the COVID bomb that locked everyone inside. The global pandemic forced gamers and non-gamers alike to stay at home and stay inside. Okay, who are we kidding? The gamers were already staying inside. Let me rephrase this. The pandemic forced even the non-gamers to stay home and sit inside. We would now all be vitamin D deficient together. Welcome, my brethren. Join us in our path to vitamin D deficiency and enlightenment. Many turned to games to keep themselves entertained in their isolation. ESO couldn't have been more ready for this boom in players. What better way to lure players in than with a Skyrim expansion? Of course, this type of unnatural growth was not sustainable. ZeniMax doesn't get to have a pandemic every year, knock on wood. So Elder Scrolls Online would bleed some of those players after this expansion and an underwhelming 2021 Blackwood expansion that added NPCs that followed you around instead of new classes like the player base anticipated didn't help matters. ZeniMax made a couple of major mistakes with the companions, but the worst was that they weren't terribly fun to be around. Limitations in their functionality aside, their personalities left a lot to be desired. They complained about every little thing you did. They couldn't carry your burdens and fell short of players' expectations of what a companion should do. If you've ever had a judgmental friend that was never happy and always complained, then you know exactly what it's like to hang out with the companions from Blackwood. In 2022, ESO added the High Isle expansion. Once again, players anticipated a new class or skill lines, but were left surprised when ESO instead added a card game. Not not just a card game, but a card game that took 15 minutes to complete. It was no longer a mini game you could do between activities. It was something that you chose to do instead of activities. And as a result, most players simply chose not to. Was this an intentional part of ESO's marketing shift to carve out its own niche of older players? Were they looking for the aging aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas that wanted to log in, play cards and decorate their house? Were they changing the direction of ESO to avoid competing with massive new upcoming MMOs like Lost Ark, New World, Ashes of Creation, Riot's MMO, or even even the MMO they themselves might be making? Maybe. It's hard for me to wrap my head around some of the decisions they've made as of late. Aside from the card game being the main feature, the Zone of High Isle was stunning. The new companions were great, especially Ember, who was actually a real pleasure to be around. So the chapter wasn't all bad. But I can't help but notice that since the announcement of ZeniMax's second game in production, ESO has steadily received smaller and smaller content updates. The dungeons team has gotten better, and the zone team is making more and more impressive zones, but the core features being added now pale in comparison to years prior when they were adding new skill lines, new guilds, new classes, and new crafting lines. Meanwhile, monetization has been noticeably cranked up, causing some groans in the community with fewer earnable things added in the game every DLC and more instead being offered in the cash shop. Things that used to be earned in game like skins and personalities are now in crates. Having an earnable house, each expansion was replaced with houses only being sold in the cash shop in High Isle. Nowadays, when they announce a DLC, they have more crown store purchases to talk about than in-game features being added. Bugs aren't lasting days or weeks, but instead months and years. Years. Brand new world boss quests that you couldn't reliably complete for well over a year. Watching ESO in recent years has been a bit like watching a friend you love let themselves go. They used to try and hide it, but now in 2022, ESO's competition was fierce. Guild Wars 2 dropped its long awaited End of Dragons expansion. Lost Ark released in the West. New World dropped its first expansion. Final Fantasy 14 was hot off its heels with Endwalker, and WoW is dropping Dragonflight. Judging by the metrics we can see, it looks like ESO is definitely feeling that pressure, and its decision to retaliate to those threats with a card game and hyper monetization has seen its player base shrink from an average of 19,000 players.
players on Steam in January to an average of 13,000 players as we approach the end of 2022. That's quite a bit lower than even pre-pandemic levels. With 2023 around the corner and the player base shrinking, I'm guessing the devs are planning for a major shot of nostalgia next year. At least that's what I would do in this situation. It will be interesting to see where they take the game next year, but perhaps more importantly, in my opinion, the next expansion has implications far beyond 2023. The 2023 announcement will tell us exactly how committed ZeniMax is to investing in ESO's future. It will answer the question of, is ZeniMax's new unannounced project getting all of the attention and their funding? Is ESO being transitioned into maintenance mode? The size and the scope of the 2023 announcement will tell us all of that and more. If the expansion announcement feels a bit underwhelming for the fourth year in a row, it may mean that ESO is sitting firmly in the rearview mirror at ZeniMax Online Studios as they look ahead to the bright new future their unannounced title offers. I would say that ESO is still a fantastic new MMO for new players to try as they have added so much good content over the years, but for the players that have been playing the game for a while, recent expansions just haven't been enough to keep them around. In this case, numbers don't lie. It may be that over monetizing and under delivering is starting to catch up to this old MMO. I hope you enjoyed this little trip down ESO's memory lane as much as I did, regardless of what happens to this game moving forward, and regardless of Zoss's intentions for it in the future, I've made a lot of fantastic memories in it over the years. It succeeded in being unique in the genre where doing so was an insane risk. It succeeded in becoming one of the biggest MMOs today. There's a lot of hard work and perseverance that clearly went into turning this into one of the most successful Elder Scrolls games ever. Here's hoping that they can turn the tide in a big way in 2023, and if not, I look forward to the unveiling of their next game. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content. Massive shout out to my YouTube members for supporting the channel in the big way that you do. If you want to become a YouTube member to have access to an exclusive Discord channel as well as get badges and emotes here on YouTube, make sure to hit the join button down below. Thanks for watching, and if you don't know what to do next, check out one of the videos popping up on screen right now.